Hello, my name is Steve Jordans. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and I'm also the director of the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab. Um, in, in my lab we essentially create technologies uh, and assess them in the hopes of enhancing education. Uh, and so I was recently invited to give a keynote at an IPON conference in Utrecht uh, which went very well. It was it was very well received and I had a lot of people give uh, requests at the end of the talk asking if I could maybe do a videotaped version that they could share with colleagues. So that's what this talk is all about. Um, the theme of the conference was on personalized connected learning uh, and I, I do a lot of work with um, peer learning and, and peer assessment technologies and so I really wanted to connect those two concepts and that's what we're going to do. So let's get at it. So when, when I thought of personalized learning, I wanted to sort of deconstruct this literally and, and think of that word personalized and think about it in terms of the classroom. If we want to personalize the classroom, what we essentially want to do is to make the students feel more like people, people that matter, people that are involved in their own education. Uh, and I think that's really critical because I'm a firm believer that really we don't teach students at all. Uh, rather, we create this context and we inspire the motivation that convinces our students to teach themselves. Only they can really engage in the learning process that, that results in uh, robust, long-lasting learning. And what we want to do is really make them feel like this is worthwhile. And the tools at our disposal are the context we create and the words and the attitude and the things that we do as teachers uh, that can try to make that context one that promotes learning and promotes a desire to learn. So how do we do that? Uh, and I'm going to argue in this talk that a core component is really making the students feel like an important part of the classroom. Uh, I'll use this term. We want them to feel like a person that matters. That's the sense in which I'm going to try to personalize the classroom. Now, how do we do that? Well, from psychology, I, I want to give you a couple of examples that show sort of the reverse. Um, situations we know that lead to a depersonalization. And from that, we can maybe learn a little bit more about how to personalize. So, the first example has to do with what happens to people as they age. And specifically, with respect to depression um, as a mental illness. In Western societies, we actually see quite a, a strong incidence of depression in the elderly, that as people age, they tend to suffer a lot more from sadness and demotivation. And, and you know, quite often, you, we have the stereotype of an older person, often in a nursing home, that will be just sitting by themselves doing nothing. Now, when we contrast that with what we often see in Eastern cultures, the contrast is pretty uh, stark sometimes. Uh, in Eastern cultures, the aged people tend to have a much higher level of mental health. They tend not to be depressed. They tend to be much more engaged in life. And as psychologists have tried to understand the cultural differences that underlie this, they think it has to do with what you actually see in these pictures that in Western cultures, we often will um, put our older people in nursing homes or assisted care centers, and we give them this kind of strange message, which, which is the following. Listen, mom or dad, you don't have to worry about anything. You've worked very hard all your life. You've worried about bills. You've worried about meals. You've, you no longer have to worry about anything. You'll be able to live at this place where everything will be done for you. Uh, your meals will be cooked, your events will be planned, you know, etc. It sounds like a nice thing to do. Now, in Eastern cultures, what they often do is have the parents live back with the family. In fact, it's not completely uncommon in some cultures that when a couple gets married, they have a certain period of time to be together as a couple, but then it's almost expected that at some point they're going to invite the parents to come back and live with them. And so they end up living as a family unit and the older people within that unit 
are still expected to do things. They still have a role to play. They may be cooking meals. They may be cleaning the house. Uh, they may be taking care of the kids after school or at other times. So they are a functioning member of that group. And so when psychologists have thought about this issue, they've come to this conclusion that for anybody to feel engaged in anything, even life itself, then that person must feel that they are playing or sharing an important role. And because we're very social beings, humans, we want that role to be something that positively impacts other human beings. So we want to feel like we're doing something that matters, um, that matters to somebody other than ourselves. And when we are playing this social role, when we are helping other people, that makes us feel good and insulates us from this isolation and depersonalization. So that's one of the major lessons uh, I want to carry forward in this talk. If we want our students to feel engaged in the classroom, then they should play or share roles with respect to their learning. Okay, so let's hold that one. And now let's go a different direction. Um, still within the clinical psychology kind of realm, you guys of course know Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud being the first person to really promote a, a clinical psychology, that the notion that um, people can have mental disorders, uh, they can be like physical disorders, and we can try to help them. But Freud took a very um, medical sort of uh, perspective on how to do this. And so he was very what we would call directive. Uh, he felt like he understood how the mind worked. And so he would interact with a client mostly just to try so that he could try to understand what was going on with the client. And then he would, in fact, direct that person. In fact, they, they would typically call them patients, right? And you would direct that patient of what to do. Um, so, oh, you want to feel better, you must do this, this, or this. Uh, one of the things we find with a lot of these directive kind of therapies is what we call patient non-compliance. That when a patient is told, do this, this, or this, quite often they, they don't. They just um, either don't, don't believe it or, or feel it's too much effort or for whatever reason do not comply. Now, um, partly because of that patient non-compliance, therapies after Freud kind of evolved in a different way. And I want to especially highlight somebody named Carl Rogers. Rogers started what we now call humanistic therapy. And within humanistic therapy, the, the therapist plays a very different role. They play more of a role of a sounding board um, with, and, and, and they refer to their patients, not as patients, but as clients. So the, the view they actually take is that the client has come to me because they're having some problem with life. And my role is to help them come to their own conclusions about the best way to sort out their problems. Um, so through the interactions that occur, the therapist, in fact, tries to play a very minimal role. He will um, prompt a patient, perhaps with, you know, why have you come to see me today? And the patient might say, well, I'm, I'm having a little bit of, of trouble um, with work-life balance. Uh, we'll pick that example. It came up one in one of these things. So, you know, work is very important to me, but it cuts into my life and and that is causing problems at home, and so now I'm, I'm worried about issues that are that are happening there. And the ther therapist might just say, well, tell me more. And might say things like, well, give me some examples of situations where problems have come up. And then might say something like, well, okay, so you chose to do that in that situation. What else might you have chosen to do? How do you think those things would have turned out? And so what they're really doing is allowing the patient, the client, I should say, to explore the situation and potentially come to a situation where they say, you know, maybe if I just did this, or may, you know, maybe if I, maybe if a client might say, maybe if I said, you know, after six o'clock, I will stop working and it'll be totally family. And if they actually, well, if they come to that conclusion themselves, one of the strong things we learn from humanistic therapy is they're more likely to follow up. They're more likely to do those things and ultimately, it seems like a much more effective therapy. Uh, Rogers himself put it the following way. In my early professional years, I was asking the question, how can I treat or cure or change this person? Now I would phrase the question in this way. How can I provide a relationship with this person 
um, that they can use for his or her own personal growth. Okay, so it's a different role, less directive, more supportive, but allowing the client to kind of figure out what their needs are. All right, once again, I want to bring this back to the classroom. Um, what does this mean here? Well, it means we would like the students to play a bigger role in, in their own learning. Um, that that would somehow empower them, that if we could come up with ways where they figured out what they had to learn and what they didn't have to learn, that would be a good thing. But, but how do we do that? Well, let's first of all just keep these things in mind and think about the modern classroom. Um, if we think first about how teaching happens, well, it's pretty directive, right? We have a teacher. Uh, the teacher has a very constrained curriculum, a, a number of issues they have to get through in the course of the classroom, and so they are basically broadcasting this information to the students um, and expecting the students to kind of you know, learn that information as well as they can. But it's kind of Freudian, right? It's kind of like, this is what you must learn, let me show you, now you learn it, you do it. So it has that disempowering nature to some extent. Um, assessment as well. If we think about assessment, well, what happens in assessment? Well, the teacher gives some assignment. So if we think of one student, the teacher gives that student an assignment. The student works on it, gives it back to the teacher. The teacher maybe gives them some comments and gives it back to the student. But we have this little insulated thing happening between a teacher and a student. Now, of course, that's happening with other students. In fact, it's happening with the whole classroom. But in every case, it's almost like we have walls between each of the students. The students are interacting with the teacher in a very directive way, and, they're play and they have very little role in their own learning. The teacher, and in fact the whole institution of education, is determining what they learn and how they learn. Okay, So we have this situation here where the students are playing a minimum role, in terms of shaping or supporting the learning context, and most of the learning interactions are directed. That, when you add those two things together, that is the formula for a disempowered, demotivated student. I have a nice picture here to kind of depict that. Maybe you guys are familiar with that look. But now maybe you have a sense of where that look comes from. In fact, that look is not altogether different from the picture I showed you earlier of the older gentleman. This is the look of someone who feels essentially helpless, that they are put in a position where things are being done for them perhaps, with the best of intentions probably, and yet because they are not playing any role, uh, and because everything is so directive, they feel very demotivated. Well, that's a pretty depressing tale so far, huh? How are we going to do something about this? Well, of course, I told you I'm from the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab, so I'm going to suggest to you that technology can play a role in, in fixing this problem. And that might seem a little strange because, you know, we're talking about a depersonalization here, and, and, and we often think of technology as this cold, you know, rational, logistic kind of thing, but, but anything but warm and cozy. However, I do want to point out that technology is neither warm or cold. Um, it's an enabler, and we can use it to enable pro-social context if we want to. This, this little robot guy here, by the way, is a hugging robot. Um, you can come up and put your arms around it, and it will hug you. Uh, just a fun example of a technology that was designed and created to be pro-social, to be warm. Uh, in fact, you could actually warm the robot, I'm sure. So it could be a nice, warm, cozy hug. Um, that's kind of what we want to be thinking about. It's a nice analogy, but how do we do that? I'm not going to tell you we have a, a complete solution, but, but I think we have at least one critical tool um, that we can use, uh, certainly at the assessment phase, and I think we can take that logic and apply it more to the teaching context as well. Okay, what's that tool? Well, we developed something called Peer Scholar. Um, I teach very large classes, and this issue of depersonalization can be even more extreme in a large class. And so we literally created this originally for my classroom to try to make 
uh, to try to change the dynamics, to try to make it less directive, and to try to give students more of a role. Now, I don't have a lot of time to describe Peer Scholar, uh, but let me give you just a taste, because that's all you need for this talk. Uh, Peer Scholar produces a three-stage process for students. So it's an activity they would do often outside the classroom, but it could be within a class as well. Uh, but it involves the following steps. And in a first step, they are asked to do anything, anything you want them to do. We call it the create phase because typically they're asked to create something. It could be a written assignment, um, but of course it could be a, a speech they record on their phones. It could be a, a song they create with GarageBand. It could be anything that you want them to create. Uh, now, I have a, a question mark here because when we were creating Peer Scholar, we were also thinking about what I sometimes call core competencies. I wanted to make sure we're exercising some of these skills we want students to learn. Um, and it's a question mark here because the skills they learn during the create phase are largely up to the instructor. If you want them to be creative, then you give them a task that asks them to be creative. If you want to exercise their critical thinking, well, then you might ask them to write an argument or something that's much more analytical. Uh, but whatever you want them to do, you ask them to do here. Uh, all right. So now it's the next two phases where the kind of cool stuff happens. In the assess phase, they log into the system and they see some subset of their peers' submissions. You can decide how many they see. I'm going to use the number five uh, for the rest of this presentation because we often use five or six, uh, but it can be anything. So, but let's imagine they're logging on and they now see five of the compositions that their peers submitted, randomly selected from the class and critically anonymously presented so they don't know whose work they're seeing. And in this phase, we say, okay, we would like you to be the teacher here. Keep in mind, sharing roles, right? Sharing a role of the teacher, kind of like that extended family where the older person is sometimes the cook, sometimes the cleaner. Well, now the student is sometimes going to be the teacher. Uh, and so in this case, we will give them a nice clear rubric, give them nice clear instructions, and maybe even give them some, some pre-training if necessary. But now they look at their peers' work and, well, they do whatever the instructor asks them to. But what I usually ask them to do is to look at each peer's work, think of all the ways it could be better, um, try to find something really good that they're already doing, and, and we'll have a comment where you can highlight that good thing they're doing. But critically, try to think of something they could change that you think would maximally improve the quality of the work. So think of all the things they could change, but then zero in on the one thing that, if changed, would make the biggest impact on the quality of the work. Describe what that thing is as clearly as you can, and then give the student some idea about how you think they might go about fixing it. Uh, and I always say, don't get too specific. Don't, you know, don't say, just write this, but push them in the right direction, uh, or at least push them in some direction, some direction that feels right to you. So, you know, keep in mind that while they're doing this, they're going to have to think critically about each um, student's work. They're going to have to think creatively about how to solve these problems once they find it. They're going to have to communicate clearly what this problem was and how to fix it. Now, these are the things that teachers do all the time, right, when they're grading students' work. Uh, but now we're working in a much more collaborative context and critically, this is an assignment they themselves did. So we've now broken down the walls between the students. They're now able to see the work of their peers. And this is a very powerful signal for them. It allows them to see where their work fits in the context of their peer work. So they will see some peers, for example, that aren't doing as good work as they are. And that should make them feel good. That should give them signals about things they're doing well. But critically, they will also see peers who are doing better work than they are. And that does a couple things. First, it makes them l literally confront the fact that, wow, um, I could do better. That person is doing better. Uh, so I'm not you know, at, at the maximum state. There, there's room for improvement in my work. And not only do I now realize that, but I have a specific example I can use to try to figure out how I could get better. What is it that that person is doing? than I'm not. So I'm learning a lot about myself. These metacognitive skills are being exercised. All right, that's the second step. 
Now, while, while every student is being the teacher for, say, five or six of their peers, at that same time, five or six peers are doing the same to their work. So when they log into the third phase here, what they see is the comments that their peers gave to their work. And they're asked to do a few things. First thing is to read through these comments critically. Now, I call this communication, but keep in mind it's a different kind of communication now. There's expressive communication, being able to give good feedback. That's what they did over here. Okay, They were practicing giving good feedback. This is receptive communication. It's shutting up and listening to what somebody is saying about my work and thinking about it deeply. And especially interesting here is the situation where we can tell the students, you know what, some of your peers are really smart. Some, not so smart. So think about it because the peer could be wrong. Okay, Just because a peer said it doesn't mean it's right. And so we're really inviting them to think critically about it, to think creatively. What if I changed my piece the way this peer suggested? Do I think it would be better? Would that result in me ultimately getting a better grade on, on this final thing? I mean, if grades are important, and they are to students. Keep in mind also that this is very collaborative. They're not just getting feedback from one peer. They're getting feedback from five or six peers. And, so they f and, and this feedback is all about how they can improve. So they have five or six of their classmates trying to help them improve their work. That's a very pro-social, collaborative context. And of course, metacognition again, well, hey, this is about their work, right? All these people are talking about their work and they're evaluating these claims. So clearly they're learning a lot about the quality of their work, what they're doing well in, and areas in which they can improve. Okay, so you get a sense of how these skills are mapping on. But again, if we back it up a little bit now to the, to the main points here of personalizing education, what we've done is involve the student directly in the learning process. Okay, They are now giving and receiving feedback from each other. The teacher is, in fact, so far as I've described it, doing very little. Now, in fact, the teacher can, if they choose after the fact, um, see the whole process that happened and add their own comments as well, which is a very good thing to do. So the, you know, then the teacher can be having the, that positive influence, but there's still a whole lot going on from student to student. So really, this is what we've done to the classroom, at least in the assessment context, right? We've got students interacting heavily with students, helping each other, making their own decisions about what they can do to improve or not, and it all feels very humanistic, you know, very sort of uh, Rogers therapy-ish. Uh, and it also echoes back to those Eastern families where we're not just doing everything for the students, we're asking them to play an active role. Just a couple of slogans that kind of fit with this. You know, the best teachers are the ones who show you where to look but don't tell you what to see. So there's a little bit of that going on here. We would have rubrics, we would have stuff, we would tell the students what to look for, but it would be up to them to use that information and to ultimately see what they see. Uh, and because everyone's giving feedback and because we're actually involving the, the students in the teaching process, um, I like this, to teach is to learn twice. I actually think that's an underestimate, by the way, because in order to teach, you have to really learn it well first. So that first learning that's required in order for you to teach it, um, I think is more than twice. So I think this is an underestimate. The important thing, though, is that we have students playing this active role. They're involved in the learning that's going on. All right. That's all well and good. It's, it's perfectly fine to have somebody like me say, hey, this is how to make the classroom better, blah, 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 blah. Um, I believe heavily in research and evidence-based. So um, yes, this seems like a good idea. Does it work? Uh, I want to tell you about a couple of different ways we've tried to analyze it. And the first one's pretty straightforward. It's, it's just basically asking the students, what do you think uh, about this process we just put you through? Uh, so I'm going to tell you about that first. And then we'll come back to a, a more proper experiment, let's say. Um, but let's talk to the students first. We asked the students a few questions. Um, here's one. The peer scholar activity really made me think. Now let me contextualize this first of all. 
we just put them through an activity, uh, an assignment. It was a lot of work. It takes them a lot of time to do my peer scholar assignments the way I set them up in my classroom because I, I asked them to, to weigh in on a very complex debate but to, to ultimately produce a very short, concise, effective argument. So it requires a lot of research and background and then a lot of you know, working on their writing. So generally, if you would expect that if you ask students, what do you think of that assignment? They'd say, oh, I'm so glad it was over. It was terrible, right? <laughs> well, they don't say these are terrible. What I'm going to do with some of these is just kind of combine these three at the end, which are the positive leaning sides uh, of, of the um, responses. So we have the neutral in the middle, people who didn't think one way or the other, and then the disagrees to the left. These are kind of the agrees, um, but of course they're graded there, so you can see that as well. Uh, but the 79% says generally 79% of students agreed that this activity made them think, which is cool. Um, did they think they learned a lot uh, about their own work by seeing and assessing the work of their peers? So I'm claiming that breaking down this wall is going to let them uh, you know, learn a lot, and, and they seem to endorse that one. They agree. They learned a lot from it. Um, did they learn a lot from the comments they got from their peers? Uh, that feedback that was coming back, did they sort of appreciate that and feel that had value? Well, 55% did. Now, uh, keep in mind that close to 20% are on the neutral here. So, you know, we're really comparing this to, um, I don't know, what? 55 to 25 or something like that, uh, who, who disagreed with this statement. So, you know, two to one students are agreeing that this, this information is helpful to them. Um, they're liking that they're getting this feedback from their peers. Um, and did they learn a lot about writing and arguing in general? This is more specific to my assignment, but over half the class uh, endorses that with, you know, a huge percent in the neutral uh, side stuff. So again, over two to one, they think, yeah, they're, they're learning a lot. Now, these things have more to do with those thinking skills I told you about. When it comes to the depersonalization or the personalization of the classroom, then perhaps this is the more relevant question that we ask. That did this whole process make my very large class seem smaller? That is, did they feel a sense of community through this process? And we see that about 54% agreed with that and only 23% disagree. So again, over two to one, students are feeling like this process of interacting with each other the way they are is making the classroom feel more like a community. And I take from that that they are feeling more like a member of the community. They are feeling more like a person that matters. Okay, That's when we ask them things. I also want to tell you about an experiment we did to try to get at this in a, in a more um, quantitative way, I guess, a more reliable way. So um, this slide's going to get a little busy, so I'm going to shrink my head in just a second. But um, I just want to tell you, we're using something called the community of inquiry. Now, the community of inquiry is a, is a scale, uh, and it measures, it's often used in online context, and, and it really measures how connected the student feels to the learning experience in general. But it breaks it down into these three things, the teaching presence. So how much how connected did I feel to the teacher when I was in this learning situation? The cognitive presence. How connected did I feel to the material I was learning in this situation? Most important for us, though, social presence. How connected did I feel to my other classmates in this situation? Did it feel like we were a community? So this is just a, a scale we can use to try to measure that. Now, what we wanted to do was to directly assess whether being engaged in, in this peer assessment has a positive effect on that. So here's the experiment we did. And let me walk you through it because it's a little confusing. A typical peer scholar assignment would just be these first three blue boxes. So students would write something, they would undergo this peer assessment step, and then they would get the feedback from their peers and they would be allowed to revise. And it would normally stop there. Um, however, we wanted to have a condition where students wrote something but didn't get peer assessment and then revised. So this group of students, we just said, you know, when, when they were here, we said, you know what, you've had a little bit of time to think about it. Look back on your work again and feel free to make any 
changes you make. Okay, now if I just stopped and marked the assignment there, it wouldn't really be fair because these students have benefited from their peers' comments and these ones haven't. So for the purpose of my assignment, we continued along and we allowed these guys now to go under peer assessment for an ultimate final revision, and these ones did not. Um, so again, they were told just think about what you did and you have one more chance to revise. So now everything's sort of fair with these two, so I can, I can count these from the marks. But this is the point from the research purposes that's important to us. Literally, one group, the blue group, went through peer assessment and then got a chance to revise. The red group did not. And at that point, we asked them to please fill out this scale. And, well, basically what we showed is that on social presence, the group that was allowed to see the comments of a subset of their peers and revise their work felt more social presence. Just one exposure to this um, resulted in a significant enhancement in the social presence. So this is a really good solid study. Randomized control group design, all that, and it really shows very clearly that this peer assessment process is enhancing the connectivity of students. It's making them feel more like people that matter within a community. Very cool. All right. So. Um, I've been talking about peer assessment. I've been talking about a particular tool, Peer Scholar. That's the tool I know best. It's the tool that we've created in our lab and continue to hone based on our research and everything we know. There are other tools out there um, that, that do the same kind of thing. So I'm, I'm a supporter of peer assessment in general. Um, there are also ways of trying to get this happening in your classroom itself. There's peer learning processes where students might help each other to learn concepts. Generally speaking, I love anything that harnesses the power of peers um, because of the two reasons I've been highlighting all along. It's non-directive. It tends to allow the students to take things where they will. You need some direction, obviously, to make sure they stay you know, on, on the context, and that's where, like in the, in the activity context, the, the, the teacher does set the rules of what goes on. Uh, and so you do keep it focused on learning. But within that, the students have some freedom to decide where things go. And critically, we are now, by, by having students sometimes be the teacher, we are letting this play this active role. We are letting them shape the learning that happens. It is no longer being done to them. It's being done with them, um, like an extended family situation. So big fan of peer assessment in general. Okay, peer assessment and, and, and peer learning, I should say. Those are the big points I have for you um, today. Um, I do want to end with one example that takes this even further that I think is very cool and shows the power. Um, you guys probably know about the Global Teenager Project, something that Bob Hoffman is, is uh, directing in, in Europe and uh, his baby. And if you want to know anything more or want to become part of it, Bob's the guy to talk to. Um, but they have a situation where they have students in, let's say, Ukraine, mixing with students in Canada, mixing with students in America, mixing with students in Lebanon, mixing with students in Africa. So they bring students together from all these different countries to form a classroom, a learning circle, as they call it. And they engage in learning together. And it tends to be fairly non-directive. It tends to be very peer pushed. And as a final project, they use peer assessment. Uh, and in fact, they use peer scholar. So in fact, we've, we have situations where students are now giving and receiving feedback across the ocean. And from contexts that are very, very different, you know, a, a student's perception of the importance of water in England is very different than a student's perception of the importance of water in Africa. You know, that's very, uh, and so now they get to share these perspectives uh, and, and even become more, it becomes more personalized because the context that they're coming from tend to be quite different. So I've actually gone to a school where uh, students were involved in this global teenager project and the students and the teachers, uh, I mean, with students, you could just see how engaged they were. They wanted to show me what they were doing and, and they wanted to show me comments that they received and talk about comments they received. Uh, and the teachers themselves have said they've never seen their students more engaged. Uh, and so I think, you know, for me, this was like, wow, this works, this works. 
Uh, and it's a real kind of nice marriage of, of Bob's you know, idea of a connected classroom, a globally connected classroom, with this peer assessment approach that really personalizes the experience for the students. Okay, with that said, here's a little bit of contact information if you'd like to learn more about anything I talked about. Um, I hope you find this video useful. Thank you for those who requested it. Thank you for those who came to the talk. And hey, I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thanks. Bye-bye.